Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are running a bit late, and we have a uh, large panel this afternoon. So please uh, take your seats as soon as as soon as possible. Um, my name is Andy Cutchins. I'm the director of the Russia Eurasia program here at CSIS, and it's a distinct pleasure to have uh, an honor to chair this uh, this this panel. I must apologize in advance, though, and that I'm going to have to leave early myself. But don't think that I am uh, taking my responsibility lightly. I have a very compelling reason. I have to get my 12-year-old daughter to basketball practice. Uh, she is she and her sixth grade uh, uh, colleagues are playing for a region-wide, multi-county uh, championship uh, in a seventh grade lead league on Sunday, and I certainly don't want to be the cause of diminishing their chances for, uh, for victory. Um, the, uh, this is a very interesting uh, uh, gathering, um, and I've been looking forward to it. Uh, in, the, in the past uh, couple of years, I've learned a lot about the OSCE through my involvement uh, in the project here at CSIS uh, on the Kazakh uh, chairmanship uh, that was led by Janusz Bogalski and the New Democracies uh, Project, and then I had the opportunity uh, to uh, go to Vienna in December, uh, just after the Astana meeting, and get a full readout uh, from the, uh, the, the various uh, departments of the OSCE about Astana. I think there was a feeling at the OSCE that the, uh, the, the message coming out of the Astana meeting uh, didn't accentuate as, as, uh, as successful as it, as it was. Uh, and that was certainly my feeling. I think uh, there were a lot of very distinguishing aspects uh, to the, uh, the Kazakh chair of the OSCE, uh, and probably the one that I was I'm most personally uh, pleased to see is the accent uh, being placed on a sort of a broader, uh, more attention to security in Eurasia, uh, including Afghanistan. Uh, they haven't taken me up on my proposal yet to rename the organization the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and Eurasia, but all in good time. Um, and I was especially looking forward to this meeting because uh, I'm a perfect example of what uh, Boulent was talking about, ignorance in Washington about SICA. In fact, uh, until about an hour ago, I would have pronounced the acronym KIKA. So already this has been a very, very successful endeavor for me. So we have a, uh, a distinguished uh, and diverse panel uh, as appropriate for such uh, diverse organizations, both in membership as well as their, uh, their substantive agenda of uh, tasks and challenges. Uh, so let's uh, move over. Let me introduce very quickly the, uh, the members of our, our panel uh, and then get to the, the panel discussion. Um, uh, to my, well, this is a little bit in order here. Uh, Ambassador uh, Ginar Aldemar is the SICA Executive Director. A welcome here to, uh, to Washington. Uh, and to his left is Alexander Pavluk. Uh, Alexander, good to see you again. Uh, the, the Head of External Cooperation at the OSCE Secretariat. Uh, and to his left is uh, Ali Jalali, uh, Distinguished Professor at the NISA Center here in Washington, former Minister of Interior to Afghanistan. Uh, and then to his left is Jared Blank, uh, who is the senior advisor at the Office of the Special Representative for Afghanistan, Pakistan. And finally, to Jared's left is James Callahan, uh, who is a program analyst at the Bureau of International Law Enforcement and Narcotics Affairs, also at the State Department. So with no further ado, let me turn the floor over to Ambassador Aldemar. Aldemar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I would like to join the others in expressing my gratitude to CSIS for organizing such a timely and important meeting. And I also thank them for giving me the opportunity of addressing this audience, which I believe uh, will be very useful at the end of the day for our cooperation with SICA and OECE. In my statement today, uh, I would like first to dwell a bit lengthy on uh, SICA for those who doesn't have more idea about our, our organization. 
uh, the principles, including the security concept of SICA, I think should be mentioned a bit lengthy in this meeting. And secondly, I would also mention the new threats and challenges facing the SICA region and how can we deal to solve these issues with the cooperation uh, of the OECE and the relevant organizations. I think uh, SICA is a multilateral forum for enhancing cooperation towards promoting peace, security, and stability in Asia through dialogue, interaction, and confidence-building measures among the member states. I think these are the key elements of SICA. It was convened at the initiative taken in October 1999 by President Nur Sultan Nazarbayev of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Actually, President Nazarbayev <coughs> is the godfather of our organization. I think we should also look at the time when this uh, announcement was made by President Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. That was the time when profound changes were taking place in the world after the disappearance of the so-called bipolar world. The moving spirit behind this initiative was to restart the previously abortive efforts to create an effective and universal body to safeguard security in Asia and move towards a unified Asian structure for collective security. Convening of SICA and the support it received from the international community was the recognition of the fact that there is a close link between peace, security, and stability in Asia and the rest of the world. We have two important documents in SICA, a declaration on the principles guiding relations between the SICA member states of 1999 and the Almaty Act of 2002. These are the founding documents of SICA and these documents set the basic framework for the relations between the member states, the objectives of the conference, and its functioning. Now we have 24 members from almost all parts of Asia, including Central Asia, South Asia, and also in the Middle East. So I think it is a unique organization getting together all these important parts of Asia. We are all aware of the fundamental premise that the security is indivisible in uh, our understanding of SICA. In this context, basic documents of SICA specifically mention that no state will strengthen its security at the expense of the security of other states, and that security of every member state is inseparably linked to the other. This is a very important concept uh, of invisibility in the security area for Zika. Another important characteristic of security in our minds uh, is to be comprehensive security. Closely linked to the concept of comprehensive nature of security in the contemporary world, security no longer emanates primarily from military superiority or quality of weapon system. The concepts of indivisible and comprehensive security are duly recognized in Almaty Act and following the spirit of Almaty Act, the catalog of SICA confidence building measures lays down five broad areas of cooperation among the member states. These are military political dimension, fight against new challenges and threats, economic dimension, the environment, and human dimension. Asia continues to face numerous security challenges which threaten not only the recent economic gains, 
but also the peace and stability in the continent. While Europe, in spite of the so-called Cold War, enjoyed an era of relative peace in the post Second World War, Asia witnessed some of the bloodiest conflicts during this period. <coughs> it's an extremely diverse region, having some of the largest and the smallest countries with significantly different levels of development and aspirations. There are also cultural, ethnic, religious, and historical differences to overcome in our region. At the beginning of the second decade of the new millennium, Sika region continues to face multiple flashpoints with significant conflict potentials, including border disputes that have been in existence for historical and other reasons, which have sometimes even led to confrontations and wars. Any of these flashpoints could spark conflagration that could undermine the peace and prosperity of the region. Recent political developments in the Sika region also act as a pointer to the new challenges faced by the region. I don't need to remind you that there is a close link between peace, security, and stability in Asia and in the rest of the world. So uh, as we come to the basic documents of Sika under these circumstances in our region, uh, they provide for mechanism to face these challenges. In the guiding principles, member states have inter alia reaffirmed their commitment to achieve full, just, and lasting relations of peace, openness, mutual trust, security, stability, and cooperation in Asia. Uh, they aim at eliminating tensions and seeking peaceful settlement of disputes. So uh, in Almaty Act, member states agreed to implement confidence building measures, which, are, which I mentioned earlier. Asia now faces with a number of non-traditional security challenges, commonly known as new threats and challenges. In this context, enemies are not states and their armies, we are faced with an unseen but more dangerous enemy. While globalization has brought unprecedented benefits to the form of rapid economic, technological, and social changes, these changes have also spawned the much more sinister byproduct of new security challenges. Some of the major non-traditional challenges faced by Asia today are terrorism, production and trafficking of illicit drugs, transnational crime, environmental degradation, spread of infectious diseases, and trafficking in human beings and small arms. These are, of course, unconventional threats and challenges which we have never faced before. Moreover, globalization has all also been blamed for increasing economic and social inequalities and consequent tension in certain parts of Asia. While poverty itself cannot be identified as a security challenge, it has certainly contributed to the rise of some of the new threats and challenges. Most of these challenges have transnational linkages aided by the ease of communications and transportation. Increasingly wired and connected world has enabled collaboration not only among the companies and communities, but unfortunately also among the terrorists and criminal groups. Today, international terrorism has become one of the most serious threats to global peace and security as well as a scourge of all democratic governments, and the Sika region has suffered most 
on the account of terrorism. Mr. Chairman, uh, in the Sika region, international terrorism has also close links with illicit drug production and trafficking, as well as transnational organized crime, money laundering, and trafficking in small arms. Terrorist groups in Afghanistan and certain other countries are providing protection to cultivators, producers, and smugglers of illicit drugs. In return, international drug mafia provides much needed funds to the terrorist groups through money laundering, which in Teralia is used for the purchasing arms from the traffickers. We are therefore faced with the vicious circle of new challenges that need to be tackled simultaneously. Therefore, fight against new threats and challenges is a very important issue for the SICA member states. SICA, on its part, has taken a very strong stand against terrorism. In all SICA declarations, the member states have reaffirmed their determination to cooperate on bilateral as well as multilateral basis to combat terrorism. SICA, on the other hand, has not confined itself to merely making statements on the issue of terrorism. SICA also has in place an action plan for implementation of confidence-building measures in this dimension. Of course, uh, the Turkish chairmanship as a coordinator and Afghanistan as a co-coordinator uh, also contributed to this process. SICA has also adopted a separate action plan for cooperation among member states in the area of illicit drug production and trafficking, which is being coordinated by Iran and co-coordinated by Afghanistan. Some of the important features of the action plan is creating network for focal points in SICA member states, dealing with relevant subjects organizing seminars and training programs, regular meetings of police chiefs, timely exchange of information, and establishment of centers of excellence. Implementation of the action plan has already commenced with the first SICA chiefs of police meeting held in Antalya in June last year. We are hopeful that Implementation of confidence building measures among the SICA member states will go a long way to address the issue of international terrorism. SICA is also a member of the core group which coordinates economic assistance to Afghanistan. SICA is also aware of the necessity of preventing terrorism through countering ideologies that justify it. For this purpose, SICA is making efforts to develop inter-civilizational and intercultural dialogue and understanding by holding seminars and meetings on this subject. But of course, SICA can't do it alone. In an increasingly interconnected and interdependent world, regional security cannot be seen in isolation. Security environment in the region has an impact in the other regions. Global peace and security can be ensured only if regional structures cooperate with each other. It is not possible for any single country or single regional grouping to meet the new challenges which are global in nature. What we need is collective and collaborative approach that would create objective conditions for understanding and resolution of complex problems faced by the global community. For identifying issues and finding practical solutions, 
it is imperative that there should be constructive dialogue and cooperation between different regional groupings. Here uh, we come, uh, what kind of cooperation could be made between SICA and the OECE? I think it is right to say that there is a considerable convergence in the aims and activities of OECE and SICA. Some of the common aims and activities of the two bodies are a political military dimension of security, combating terrorism, conflict prevention, economic and environmental activities, and cooperation in human dimensions. In other words, SICA, uh, these issues in SICA are also coinciding with the so-called three baskets of the OECE. There are also commonalities between SICA's confidence building measures and the documents on the confidence building measures of the Helsinki Final Act. Uh, of course, it will be not, it will not be out of place to mention that out of 24 member states of SICA, seven are full members of the OECE, while eight are partner states to the OECE. So there are many states uh, taking place in both organizations. Therefore, I think there's a considerable scope for collaboration and cooperation between SICA and the OECE. Of course, OEC has gained valuable experience in implementation of the confidence building measures in political, military, human, economic, and environmental dimensions, as well as in the field of new threats and challenges and their solutions. On the other hand, SICA has embarked on the path of implementing confidence building measures in these dimensions only very recently. Therefore, SICA can learn from the experience of OECE in implementing confidence building measures in different areas. First of all, SICA can learn a lot from the sophisticated and already implemented political military confidence building measures of the OECE. Moreover, regional organizations like SICA and the OECE have an important role to play in countering new threats and challenges. They can address the issues that are typical and of direct relevance to the respective regions. <coughs> in recent times, OEC has been increasingly focusing on terrorism and related new threats and challenges to ensure security in the region. Similarly, SICA has also aims to create a meaningful security environment to meet these challenges in the region through dialogue, cooperation, and the confidence building measures among the member states. Therefore, there are indeed excellent prospects for cooperation between SICA and OECE. A modest beginning of this direction has already been made at SICA's invitation, SICA has been participating in seminars, workshops on terrorism organized by OEC during the last two years. Of course, we can and we should do more in this direction. Asia is not only the most important source of energy, but also been showing remarkable economic growth over the last few years. Asia has emerged as a manufacturing hub and source of supply for cheap goods to the West. <coughs> Therefore, trade and economic ties between Asia and transatlantic region adds to the global stability and comprehensive security. Last but not least, SICA can also avail itself of the highly developed human rights mechanism of the OECE, especially in cooperation with ODIR. 
However, we should be realistic, Mr. Chairman, because we are aware that the nature of the challenges faced by SICA is different from the challenges faced by the OEC. We therefore need, at first, to identify the specific issues on which the two cult structures can cooperate and adopt the step-by-step -step approach in carrying forward this cooperation on a long-term basis. As a first step, the secretaries of SICA and OEC can start working together in identifying these issues carefully and the nature of cooperation uh, also can be <coughs> studied. As wisely stated by President Nur Sultan Nazarbayev of Kazakhstan at the third SICA summit last year, by the time he was the chairman of the OECE and uh, he is the founder of SICA, there should be a closer and institutional relations between the two organizations. I think today's meeting gives us an excellent opportunity to promote this cooperation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ambassador. That was an excellent uh, comprehensive overview of, of, uh, of, of SICA. Let me see if I can pass my little test. The, the, the seven member countries that are members of both organizations, yes. Turkey, the five Central Asian stands, and then Russia. I have to Russia. Mm. Huh. And I am but a so-called Russia expert. Not five Central Asian states. <laughs> is not of no, SICA. but uh, okay. Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan was the other. Okay. Okay. There we go. Uh, Alexander, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me maybe start by slightly disagreeing with you, and I uh, immediately apologize for that. I think that probably there is no need to rename the OEC. It happens often in this town. Really, but uh, for me it's the first time and uh, I uh, kind of feel uncomfortable. But what I want to say is that probably there is no need to rename the OEC, as you, uh, I think, suggested at the very beginning, because what we see is a new and rather promising organization in the making in Asia itself, which is SICA. So uh, uh, that's why, uh, and I think that that's uh, the focus of this uh, mm, uh, seminar is a very right one. We have to think jointly about uh, how we should uh, improve cooperation between the OECE and SICA. In particular, as the ongoing developments in North Africa, or as we call it in the OECE in South Mediterranean, is a strong reminder to all of us of how closely interlinked security is between neighboring regions. And uh, in our case, for example, OECE and SICA, we are two neighboring, I would say, overlapping regions with uh, uh, um, uh, shared membership, which already uh, was mentioned here. So I will try to be brief in what I will say, and uh, 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 let me uh, maybe uh, uh, structure it in two parts. First, I will briefly say about the essence of the OCE approach to new uh, secur security threats and challenges, or uh, in the OCE we uh, call them transnational security threats and challenges. And secondly, to say a few words about the OCE's cooperation with SICA. So on the first one, uh, uh, just uh, uh, maybe to summarize uh, uh, briefly, that the OCE has been dealing with uh, new threats or transnational uh, uh, threats and challenges for almost a decade. Basically, we have started to actively uh, mm, get involved in this area after 9-11, which actually sharpened the international understanding of the uh, magnitude and global scope of uh, the new security threats. And OCE, uh, uh, of course, was one of those organizations who reacted immediately. So over the past decade, we uh, mm, uh, build networks. We actually work to promote good practices. And we were trying to work in niches, supplementing the efforts of other organizations. Those niches have included uh, areas such as combating terrorism, organized crime, in, uh, including illicit drug trafficking and trafficking in human beings, strengthening capacities in border security and management, and in law enforcement, or controlling the spread of small arms and light weapons. Actually, in the last two years, uh, uh, last year and this year, within the OCE, the 
has been quite a comprehensive review among participating states about the efficiency of the OSCE work in this area of combating transnational security threats, and also probably about identifying new niche areas where the OSCE can play a useful role, such as, for example, cybersecurity or implementation of the UN Security Council Resolution 1540. Uh, so over the years, we have developed certain institutional capacities. Uh, participating states adopted political strategies and decisions, and we accumulated certain rich experience in fostering the implementation of the global UN conventions and in assisting our participating states in enhancing their relevant capacities. The second point uh, here I would like to mention is that the OSCE has approached uh, transnational threats uh, from a cross-dimensional perspective and in a comprehensive way, which actually is in line overall with the organization's overall cooperative and comprehensive approach to security. And in this approach, uh, upholding human rights and promoting functioning democratic institutions bears equal weight alongside the political, military, and economic and environmental security dimensions. And as I mentioned, now uh, participating states are uh, uh, reviewing uh, this work. It's still an ongoing process. The Secretary General prepared upon the uh, uh, request of participating states two rather comprehensive reports of the current OOC work in those areas. The work uh, is being continued, so I don't want to go into details of, of our internal kitchen, especially that, uh, as I said, this process has yet to be finished. But I would say, and this is my third point uh, about uh, transnational security threats, that one conclusion which is obvious and which is relevant for this discussion is that increased <coughs> interaction and synergy with other organizations is critical in dealing effectively with transnational threats, especially now actually at the times of financial constraints and limited resources experienced by national governments and experienced by, I would, dare to say all international and regional organizations, OSCE is uh, not an exception. And here I come to the second part of w what I would like to say is about uh, our cooperation with SICA, uh, because SICA is clearly one of those regional organizations to which OSCE pays uh, much attention. And I think the fact that uh, my organization has decided to send its representative to this seminar is an indication of the importance that we do attach to our interaction with SICA. If we look, I think, at our cooperation with SICA, uh, I would say that it is sort of driven by three factors. The first is our actually shared, I believe, recognition of the global reach of new threats and of the need to cooperate in addressing them. The second is our shared membership, and uh, Ambassador Aldemir mentioned uh, uh, those uh, member states and uh, uh, partners that we have in common. And I would say that these countries actually play a role of, a, of an important bridge between our two organizations. I think it was Kazakhstan and Turkey who actually sort of were, uh, have been in the lead of uh, bringing OCE and SICA closer together through a rather consistent effort through a number of years. And third, this is a similar approach that the two organizations have to uh, addressing security threats and challenges. Ambassador Tulun mentioned the motto of the Turkish SICA chairmanship, uh, constructing cooperative security in Asia while actually OCE has been a pioneer in promoting the very concept of comprehensive cooperative security from the very actually first days of the establishment of the OEC. I then would like to say that uh, from my personal uh, 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 opinion that in recent years the OEC SICA cooperation has already made a significant progress. Uh, last year was in particular dynamic as the uh, 2010 OEC Kazakh chairmanship paid much attention to promote and closer OEC SICA contacts. I think that by now we have developed uh, better mutual knowledge and understanding. I mean, on our side at least, we uh, probably know much more about uh, SICA than we used to know uh, a couple of years ago. And I hope that uh, for SICA also, OSCE uh, is uh, better known as an organization, which is largely thanks to our regular cross-participation in each other's events and to several visits by the representatives of SICA Secretariat to the OSCE Secretariat, where we tried actually to share 
whatever uh, modest experience we have. And I would say then that actually uh, the essence of our interaction so far has been actually the sharing of mutual experience. This is important and I think it needs uh, to be continued. And the OCE is open to sharing the merits of comprehensive and cooperative security and its rich experience across the three security dimensions, such as, for example, in confidence building measures that uh, was mentioned here by a number of uh, previous speakers, where the OCE certainly has developed a significant experience over the decades, uh, actually, of its work and existence. I, uh, uh, for example, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, if ODIR would be invited to a, a given future SICA event, uh, my colleagues from ODIR would be happy actually to attend and to share their relevant experience. I know that, for example, SICA will be holding uh, uh, an activity on combating uh, trafficking in human beings at the end of May in Natalia. Again, I'm sure that our special representative on combating trafficking in human beings if necessary, would be happy actually to exchange views and uh, mutual uh, experiences. Uh, but also, I think that as Seeker increasingly develops its relevant capacities and practical activities, in particular in addressing transnational threats, this might be actually time to think about probably going slightly beyond the mere exchange of experience and expertise that characterized the initial stage of our interaction, but also uh, to explore more practical ways of engaging with each other in addressing some of the security threats and challenges. Of course, pending the uh, agreement of our participating and seek as member states, because as it was pointed out earlier today, both organizations are based on consensus of its participating and member states. For example, and then when we think in those terms, I think Afghanistan certainly comes to uh, 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 the mind as an important element of possible uh, OSCE SICA practical cooperation. Uh, it is both SICA member states and important OSCE uh, partner for cooperation. As uh, I remember at its last meeting of senior officials, SICA adopted actually a concept paper on participation in the Afghanistan core group. The OCE is also part of that group that brings together a number of regional organizations and institutions engaged with Afghanistan. And OCE itself has been engaged with Afghanistan since 2003, when Afghanistan actually became our Asian partner for cooperation. The OCE uh, has provided election support on four occasions to the uh, actually national parliamentary and presidential elections in the country. Uh, we sponsor more or less regularly participation by representatives from Afghanistan in relevant OSCE activities. And in 2007 in Madrid, OSCE participating states adopted a decision on OSCE engagement with Afghanistan, which actually is the only decision, specific decision that OSCE has vis-a-vis -vis its given partner, uh, state partner for cooperation. And in, in, in implementation of that decision, 16 extra budgetary projects have been developed and implemented within a focus on strengthening borders between Central Asian states and Afghanistan, fostering cross-border and law enforcement cooperation, and uh, capacity building and training on border security and management, police and customs. So, and as you heard earlier today from the representative of the Lithuanian Embassy, uh, the Lithuanian OSCE chairmanship sees the promotion of closer cooperation and building synergies between the OSCE and other international, regional, and sub-regional organizations and institutions as one of its priorities. And as I <coughs> see at least the continuing interest on both sides, OSCE and SICA, uh, in uh, uh, developing cooperation, I see leadership displayed by Turkey, Kazakhstan, Lithuania. So personally, I'm quite optimistic about the prospects of the OSCE SICA cooperation. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Alex Alexander. Uh, a question of, of clar clarification. One of the things I do, do know about uh, SICA was that they were a member of the, the core group of uh, regional organizations that met in Kabul on the eve of the Kabul conference on July, July 19th, mm -hmm. ECHO, SARC, um, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The OSCE, though, I, I, we were there. you were there as well? Yes. Okay, very good. Thanks. And with that, uh, it's a perfect uh, transition moment to uh, turn to uh, Dr. Jalali. Uh, and uh, I, I must uh, in remind our, our, our panelists that uh, the time is limited and that uh, we are scheduled to uh, move to a reception at 6, six o'clock. Um, 
Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon. I appreciate the uh, remarks made here uh, during this uh, panel and before. And I uh, also uh, value what uh, um, OSCE and SICA has done in the past few years. I am familiar with both organizations uh, during my uh, previous reincarnation. In 1990s, uh, when I was uh, covering uh, Central Asia for the Voice of America as analyst of the region, for many years I uh, covered the uh, five uh, Central Asian states and uh, where I came across uh, the activities of OECE, particularly in uh, the conflict of uh, Tajikistan, which I covered extensively uh, from uh, 1993 to all the way to 1997 when the uh, court was made and uh, uh, the uh, at the same time, OEC's uh, actions and operations in uh, Azerbaijan was covered by me. With uh, SICA, also I have a history. When that idea was first uh, offered or expressed by uh, uh, President uh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, I was lucky to have several interviews with him. And one of these interviews, I at length actually asked him about the challenges facing that because at that time he was trying to, uh, you know, uh, support that idea as uh, another organization uh, in line with uh, OEC. I'm happy to see that this idea is now, uh, you know, working. Uh, and uh, as far as Afghanistan is concerned, Afghanistan is a founding member of SICA at the same time. Afghanistan is a... Um, uh, Partner for Cooperation uh, of uh, uh, OECE since 2003. Uh, the uh, title of this, this conference is uh, Regional Approach to Regional Problems. Two very complex things. And uh, with regional problems and then how difficult it is to bring some kind of reconcile diverging definition of problems among countries. And, uh, and then to reconcile the diverging approaches of different countries. So I, uh, good luck to you. Uh, it, is, it is something we can talk about, but uh, we have to realize and recognize the fact that Afghanistan is a member of several organizations like this organization, and still we have the problem. Therefore, I want to share some ideas some, some my, of my, from my experience as a former journalist and analyst, as a former minister of interior of Afghanistan, and before that, as a member of resistance against the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. The, uh, the, uh, sometimes I call Afghanistan a theme park of problems. <laughs> And it is true, you find any problem, you can find it there. And therefore, the challenges facing Afghanistan in the context of that region is a microcosm of transnational threats that is today faced by many nations in a globalized world. However, the complexity comes when you look at these threats in different dimension. It's local. It is regional and it is global, all these things. So therefore, sometimes I think that maybe that Afghanistan is probably a test case for these organizations, whether they can deal with these different threats in a kind of coordinated way. At the same time, I believe Afghanistan could, could serve as an engine of transformation of the procedures that actually governs the uh, operation and action of these different organizations. I probably say this also for, uh, for NATO. For new NATO, if new NATO is going to uh, deal with the new kind of threats, which is different from traditional threats that NATO actually gave birth to NATO, then I think Afghanistan can be a test case at the same time 
uh, engine for transformation. Having said that, uh, during my uh, initial years in Central Asia, the, the, the Central Asia often looked at, uh, was looked at from a Eurasian perspective. Many challenges, however, the region faced and is going to face are linked to the South. Both Central Asia and South Asia face common security challenges, including the threat of terrorism, religious extremism, trafficking of narcotics and arms. However, I would like to uh, emphasize here one thing that, unfortunately, sometimes I hear it is too much emphasis of drug trafficking as a major threat in between Afghanistan and Central Asia. Of course it's a threat. I dealt with it uh, and found it very difficult three years ago as a Minister of Interior. However, I hear also some views that to establish a cordon sanitaire around Afghanistan, this will do the thing. Problems of trafficking does not happen on the borders. It's somewhere else. Borders, of course, is important. Controlling borders is important. But no country in the world can seal a border, including here in the United States. Look at the south, Mexico. Certainly, Afghanistan cannot do it with Pakistan, with Iran. Of course. There are some certain activities going on. I, I also appreciate the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, cooperation from different countries to do this. But I think drug trafficking in Afghanistan is the cause and result of instability in Afghanistan. Unless you deal with instability in Afghanistan, you can stop the drug trafficking in the border. At the same time, you try to seal one area let me give you some example from uh, Afghan-Tajikistan border. We, we, we actually tried to seal several parts of that border. However, it's 1,500 kilometers. But the people who were this side of the border, in the other side of the border, uh, we have to uh, remind ourselves that drug trafficking does not initiate, uh, uh, is, is not done by only one party. There are several parties involved in different countries. So they came out very innovative. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, ways and means. Even I f I, I, we, we discovered homemade gliders who were taking the, the drug from this side of the border to the Amur River, to the other side of the Amur River. So therefore, it is not only just stopping drug trafficking the border. You have to help that country to build itself unless you mainstream drug counter and narcotic issue in all aspects of development, governance, security, and development. You cannot deal with it in a separate issue. But uh, with the issue of uh, terrorism, of course, Afghanistan is, is, uh, uh, is a source of, 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 um, uh, of problems for Central Asian countries. Uh, I, I, even today, the, uh, the, uh, Tajik, the Uzbekistan the Islamic Organization of Uzbekistan uh, and also uh, in the north of Afghanistan is, 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 has a lot to deal with, with instability in Uzbekistan. In Tajikistan today in Qarategin, once you know, after the, of the peace treaty, it was, it was calm. Today it is becoming more unstable. And as long as northern Afghanistan is unstable, this situation will continue. And uh, at the same time, the, uh, there are problems with uh, uh, the uh, weapons, uh, you know, trafficking women, uh, weapons in, 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 in a human being. Uh, these are all problems on board. However, in order to deal with these, of course, we have to seal the border. At the same time, in order to deal with it in the long term, you have to go to the source. You cannot solve a problem unless you go to the source. The source is Afghanistan. You have to help Afghanistan uh, build itself, stabilize itself, build institutions that can, can, can actually um, uh, be of, of, of uh, kind of a, uh, effectiveness in Afghanistan and in the region. I'm happy to see that the transition uh, strategy of the U.S. is working very well militarily. However, it's fragile. Unless this military success that we see today in Helmand, Kandahar, and other, in, even in the north, is sustained by good governance, 
the rule of law, good institution, security institutions, it is, will be fragile and reversible. And I believe that the best thing that regional uh, uh, organization can do is to help Afghanistan help itself, help Afghanistan to build the capacity so that it can deal with these issues um, uh, in an in a, in a, uh, effective way. I'm not going to uh, talk more about the, the uh, cooperation, what kind of a cooperation can we expect for SICA or OCE or other organizations. Let me come to a few conclusions that I, I would like to uh, offer here. First, uh, the, uh, the, the regional organization can help only if, can, if, they, if they can find the right context for it. What is the context? It's a local, it's regional, or global. You have to find a context first that in that context you can become effective. The uh, second, I think everything starts from bilateral cooperation. Without bilateral cooperation, it is very difficult to hope for a regional solution of problems. However, the uh, regional organizations can bring some synergy to these uh, bilateral kind of cooperation. And this is something that we expect from regional organization. Uh, the uh, other issue, we have to realize that there are certain obstacles in the region that can, can actually undermine whatever cooperation you try to, to uh, support. One is the uh, kind of uh, different procedures between countries. Different perspectives on issues in different countries. You remember that in 1990s, the, the three contiguous uh, oblasts or provinces in Fergana Valley of three countries, that is Osh, Khujand, uh, Osh in Kyrgyzstan, uh, Khujand in, in uh, Tajikistan, and Andijan in Uzbekistan. It created a kind of consortium to deal with drug trafficking. Soon, in a, in a, in a, not in a very uh, you know, uh, long, the, the cooperation got mired in political and security, actually problems and divergences. So therefore, it is not, nothing can happen in a vacuum. We have to realize that security, political issues in different countries can, can, can actually affect, can boost or undermine certain cooperation projects. The uh, corruption is everywhere. In Afghanistan, you have corruption as far as drug trafficking and, and uh, terrorist activities are concerned. You have it across the border. You have it in Pakistan. You have it in Iran. While 40 to 50 percent of Afghan drugs passes through Iran to Turkey, somebody is helping that. I, I'm, uh, you know, I appreciate the uh, cooperation from Iran and UK that helped us during my uh, uh, term to build 25 security posts along Afghan-Iranian uh, border. But still, the traffickers find ways to bypass them. Uh, how they do it, it is both the problems in Afghanistan, both in Iran and beyond. The, uh, at the same time, I would say that while these issues are affecting the security and stability in the short term, I think the long-term solution, the ideal, which is not probably the potential is there, but I don't expect that it will happen, that is the transnational trade and transit trade cooperation. Afghanistan is disadvantaged by being a landlocked country. However, traditionally Afghanistan used that location it has between South Asia and Central Asia to be a bridge for uh, transnational transit trade and other cooperation. And historically, these two regions dealt with each other in different ways. And sometimes the invasion came from the north, ideas went from the south to the north, but at the same time, the time came that the two countries or the two regions found a way to enrich each other, to
Today it is possible, however, as long as security and political issues are create divergent perspectives on the issue, it will be difficult. However, it does not mean we have to stop. I think we have to take uh, each issue one by one. Today there are certain issues working. The, uh, uh, the uh, export of uh, power from Central Asia to Afghanistan, Pakistan. The TAPI, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, pipeline from uh, Turkmenistan to Afghanistan to uh, Pakistan and, and uh, in, in uh, India. And also the, the recent uh, agreements between Afghanistan, Iran, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan to create a land uh, a kind of a, a, a system of land transportation between Central Asia, Iran, and Europe. The uh, Indian project, of, which is completed now from uh, uh, Zaranj Dilaram, which joins the uh, ring road of Afghanistan, and then to Shabahar. These are all projects that you have to take one by one before you can expect that a major uh, you know, uh, uh, a project can bring fruit to that region. I will stop here, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jalali, uh, for the very, very thoughtful uh, remarks. I think it's an ideal segue uh, to our next speaker, uh, <coughs> Jared Blanc, uh, who has been dealing with the theme park of problems, as you were referred to Afghanistan from his uh, perch in the uh, Office of the Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. Jared? Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to CSIS, and thank you to uh, all of my colleagues on the panel now and, and the previous panels for what have been, I think, extremely informative discussions. Uh, I am not by any means an expert on either the OSC or SICA, and so I'll be brief and I'll be focused on the role of, of Afghanistan in the region and the region in Afghanistan. Secretary of State Clinton spoke to the Asia Society in New York three weeks ago and outlined U.S. strategy toward Afghanistan and Pakistan. If you haven't yet read her speech, it's avail available on the Internet, and I would, uh, I would strongly commend it. Uh, it's a very public and very comprehensive statement of how we see the coming year. She talked about three interlocking surges, a, uh, a military offensive against al-Qaeda terrorists and Taliban insurgents, a civilian campaign to bolster the government's economies and civil societies of Afghanistan and Pakistan to undercut the pull of the insurgency, and finally, an intensified diplomatic push to bring the Afghan conflict to an end and to chart a new and more secure future for the region. I, I think that it's clear that OSC and, and, and SICA, and, and the two of them especially in cooperation, have important things to contribute on both the second and the third of those surges, the civilian surge in governance, economics, and civil society, and a new diplomatic push to uh, bring the conflict to an end. So I'll just briefly give some thoughts about directions in both of those areas and thoughts that I think align very closely to what uh, Minister Jalali has already said. Um, in the second surge of governance, economics, and civil society, I think that there are, uh, there are two things that these organizations can look to do. The first is that the, the, the governance problems of Afghanistan, of course, are partially the cause of and partially the result of things like the trade in, in, in narcotics and some of its subsidiary trades. So, for example, precursor chemicals for the production of narcotics, uh, the trade in, in ammonium nitrate fertilizer, which is not legal in Afghanistan um, and it, which is used to create uh, improvised explosive devices. So, both of these organizations, I think, have a role to play in creating both the legal infrastructure and also providing technical assistance to implement the legal infrastructure to address some of the illicit elements of trade. Um, and then there's a more direct, I think, thing that, that both organizations can contribute and, and which the OSC certainly is doing quite a bit of already, which is capacity building for Afghan civil servants, for uh, civil society leaders, for journalists, for others. Um, so that some of the, the, the problems in Afghanistan uh, can be addressed more comprehensively, more thoughtfully by Afghan leaders themselves. So more of that from both, both organizations I think would be very valuable. Uh, on the diplomatic push, and I think on this point I'm actually just going to quote the Secretary who said that all of Afghanistan's neighbors and near neighbors stand to benefit 
from a responsible political settlement in Afghanistan and to an end of to al-Qaeda's safe, uh, safe ha havens, it would reduce the terrorist and narcotic threat to their own citizens, create new opportunities for commerce, and ease the free flow of energy and resources throughout the region. Um, and so I, I think that we can think about this regional diplomatic push, uh, both in terms of the diploma diplomacy that needs to be done, but also in terms of some of the, the enabling things that need to be done to take advantage of future successes and then achieve some of those things on uh, regional trade, on addressing the narcotics threat, et cetera. And those are all areas where I think these two organizations can be very, very helpful. Um, uh, Minister Jalali has already pointed out transit trade, which is critical for Afghanistan and critical for the region. The Afghanistan-Pakistan transit trade agreement, which was signed at the end of last year, ratified at the beginning of this year, and which will go into force uh, this summer, is probably the most important bilateral agreement between the two countries since their founding. Um, I think it also serves as a potential model for transit trade agreements between Afghanistan and its neighbors to the north. Uh, it, it's clear, though, that even if we were to overcome the tremendous hurdles to get to those agreements, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to actually make them effectively implementable. And I think both organizations have something that they can contribute on, on, on the, the creation of the legal regime and then also the implementation of the legal regime. Um, and, and, and similarly, I think, on the free flow of energy uh, and, and on essentially knitting together a more cohesive region, both because of the hoped for effects of the regional diplomatic push, and also in a sense to bolster and reinforce them so that the region as a whole has something to gain through uh, a sustained peace and something to lose uh, through a, a, um, a loss of what the minister I think has correctly described as the, the fragile and reversible gains seen so far. Um, so that, with that, I think, uh, I think again, thanks to, thanks to the organizers and thanks to the two organizations for the creative work already underway. Thanks very much, Jared, for your uh, focused uh, remarks. And uh, I completely agree with you about the, the comment about the Afghanistan-Pakistan trade and transit agreement, uh, both in its uh, significance and as well as the, uh, its potential as a model for other trade and transit agreements in the region. Uh, before I turn to um, uh, James Callahan from uh, the State Department, uh, I will bid you adieu uh, and call on my colleague Bulent uh, Alaritza to uh, uh, to chair the rest of the, the rest of the panel, and I apologize for that. And, uh, and I'm even going to make a uh, uh, a self advertisement. Uh, I can't resist after the comments of Minister Jalali and uh, uh, and Jarrett uh, about an article that I have coming out in the next issue of the Washington Quarterly that looks. Uh, precisely at the uh, the imperative and the challenges for uh, developing this regional economic uh, strategy and cooperation around Afghanistan. So thank you very much. Let me turn the floor over to Mr. Callahan. Thank you. <clears throat> as it's uh, getting close to 6 o'clock, I'll try to be very brief as well. Fortunately, Mr. Jalali has covered uh, some of the issues that I would have talked about uh, at greater length, uh, and corruption being one of those uh, most important ones. I think it's, uh, it's useful to consider that uh, the threat of narcotics trafficking uh, in the region uh, for all of the countries of the region, it's not, it's not just a, an idle threat. You, you can look at what happened in Kyrgyzstan recently and see the power of uh, drug-related money, drug-related organized crime as having had some influence uh, in uh, the events in the southern uh, Kyrgyzstan in June uh, during the interethnic uh, conflict there. Uh, whether it was a driving force or simply took advantage of it is difficult to say, but it does indicate that the ability of uh, organized crime to raise money uh, for whatever purposes it wants can be quite destabilizing for governments. Uh, additionally, as has already been expressed uh, quite well, uh, the terrorist organizations do use uh, drug-related funding for their own purposes, not that they're trafficking necessarily themselves, but the traffickers uh, often uh, are supporting those organizations, supporting the Taliban in the region. Uh, additionally, of course, the countries of the region are afflicted by, in, in Central Asia, as well as in, certainly in Pakistan and Iran and Afghanistan itself, high rates now of drug abuse by their own citizens. They're no longer simply transit countries, but also their destination countries. And related to this has been a, a spike in HIV AIDS, which is driven by injecting drug users in the region. Uh, just a short uh, history of uh, uh, drug production or opiates production in Afghanistan. 
there are some uh, who seem to believe that uh, this only took off after 9-11 uh, and the invasion of Afghanistan by the uh, international community. As a result, uh, actually, uh, the production of uh, opiates in Afghanistan started taking place during the period after the Soviets left when there was a period of warlordism and then when the Taliban took over. During that period, during the period that the Taliban controlled most of Afghanistan, it became the world's largest producer of uh, opiates. And only in the year 2000, uh, 2001, did the Taliban, for whatever reason, uh, ban uh, opiate production in Afghanistan and brought that number down significantly. But of course, after 9-11, uh, in the conflict uh, that followed that and in the uh, period of uh, instability uh, as well as the uh, military actions, uh, farmers were able then to start uh, producing opium again. Uh, no one really knows what would have happened uh, had 9-11 uh, not happened and had the Taliban been put to the test of uh, another year of, uh, of a poppy ban. Uh, there are many who think that it was only done to force prices up. But in any event, uh, as you all know, that the production of, uh, of uh, opiates in Afghanistan then uh, began another period of rapid growth. Certainly the U.S. government didn't pay enough attention. The international community didn't pay enough attention to what was happening in regard to production uh, of opium uh, and heroin, and that has certainly led to uh, an increase during that period of funding available to the Taliban to uh, reinitiate their own activities. In terms of Central Asia, which is uh, my area of specialty, uh, I would mention that Iran and Pakistan both have very serious uh, drug abuse problems themselves and, as has been mentioned, are certainly uh, major transit areas. But in terms of Central Asia, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime estimate that 25 to 30 percent of the opiates that are trafficked out of Afghanistan go across the northern border. And the primary de destination is, of course, Russia. Uh, very little of that, uh, of those opiates uh, from Afghanistan actually affect the United States but it's U.S. policy to do all we can to support the governments of the region and support Afghanistan in combating uh, trafficking because of the impact it has on security and stability in the region. I'd say that uh, all countries uh, in the region, in the, the Central Asian countries, take the issue very seriously. Uh, they see the impact uh, on their own population of drug abuse, of increased HIV rates, as well as the potential for uh, extremists to use drug-related profits to destabilize their own countries. That said, and has, <clears throat> and has already been said, uh, corruption is certainly a major issue uh, to a greater or lesser degree in all the countries, uh, so that if you look at the amounts of uh, opiates that are being trafficked through there and the numbers of seizures year by year, uh, the seizures are very small. Uh, this isn't terribly unusual because, uh, as we've seen on our own border, it's very difficult to seize a very high percentage of drugs, but it is indicative that there is something uh, more than simply uh, traffic by unaffiliated uh, traffickers and, and organized crime itself. Uh, the problem of official collusion is, is one that has to be dealt with uh, in all of the countries of the region. Uh, the U.S. at this point is working very uh, heavily, I would say, in Afghanistan to work with the counter-narcotics authorities. Uh, the State Department has a, a large program working with the Drug Enforcement Agency and other U.S. agencies uh, with the counter-narcotics uh, police of Afghanistan. And I would say very effectively uh, in terms of developing uh, units, uh, vetted units and task forces that have had great success in Afghanistan uh, in uh, seizing drugs and in actually going after high-value uh, traffickers in the organized crime networks. Uh, again, corruption uh, does not always, it means that uh, it does not always work the way we'd like it to work uh, in terms of convictions, but it certainly is a great step forward and in many ways it is an example for what we would like to uh, do to work with the other governments in the region. In terms of the regional issue, uh, there really has not been very much regional focus on counter-narcotics. It tends to be done on a country-by-country -country basis in Afghanistan and Central Asia and Pakistan without a, uh, a real strategy for the most part. Uh, looking at what other organizations are doing in the region, the European Commission has had a, two programs in Central Asia for a number of years now. Uh, fairly well-funded programs, one the Border Management Program for Central Asia, BOMCA, 
and the other, the, <coughs> the Central Asian Drug Action Plan, which now is primarily focused on drug demand reduction. Uh, unfortunately, these being a regional program, they really are not impl uh, implemented as a regional program. They're implemented really on a country-by-country -country basis, and they don't involve an overall strategy. Uh, the CSTO has been mentioned. Uh, CSTO does have uh, a role in the region in promoting counter-narcotics activities, but it has been quite limited to date. Again, it doesn't seem to involve a regional strategy and primarily focuses on an annual operation called Operation Canal, in which a number of the countries uh, who are members of the CSTO uh, collate their statistics on drug seizures, uh, but it does not seem to be what we would call a real operation. The NATO-Russia Council uh, is quite involved. Uh, one of the more successful programs or projects of the NATO-Russia Council has been a training program that's been in effect since 2006 to train Central Asian and Afghan uh, counter-narcotics police, uh, often together to promote regional cooperation. Uh, they, they are trained uh, primarily uh, at Domodedovo Training Center uh, in, outside of Moscow. Uh, now they're also training in St. Petersburg. Uh, the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency is their administration is working with the Russians now in some of those training centers. Uh, there are mobile training teams that operate in the region. Uh, the Turkish government, through the um, Turkish Academy on Organized Crime, uh, Against Organized Crime and Drug Trafficking, TADUK, is very active in managing training teams in that region. Again, though, it is focused uh, entirely on training and really is not part of an overall strategy. The United Nations uh, Regional Center for uh, Central Asia, uh, which is a preventive diplomacy center, has as one of its priorities the issue of drug trafficking as well as uh, counterterrorism. It, though, does not have a programmatic uh, or a strategic view so far of dealing with drug trafficking and is primarily uh, providing a certain level of analysis. Uh, I would say that the, the organization in the region which is most effective in terms of developing strategies, maybe uh, no, no organization is that effective yet in actually combating the traffic in the area, but the, in terms of developing strategies, it has been the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Uh, they've had strategies in Central Asia. They have a memorandum of understanding with all of the Central Asian countries as well as Russia and Azerbaijan, which has been in effect since about 1997. Uh, that has formed a basis for a number of projects which are done on a regional basis to promote intelligence collection uh, and uh, analysis and sharing among agencies and among countries in the region, as well as uh, computer-based training programs and programs on <coughs> controlled deliveries and precursors. Probably the most effective uh, regional program that the UNODC has had has been on precursors. Uh, which has been uh, running not just in Central Asia, but Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iran. Um, additionally, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime has a number of strategies under what they call their rainbow strategy, uh, which includes separate strategies to promote uh, intelligence sharing between Afghanistan, uh, Iran, and Pakistan. Uh, the Caspian Sea Initiative, which is to promote, again, intelligence sharing and cooperation. Uh, among the Caspian Sea uh, border states. Uh, the Paris Pact uh, is the overall umbrella, um, I guess, organization in a, in a sense uh, that manages the rainbow strategy and for which UNODC is the secretariat. The Paris Pact is made up of uh, a number of nations that are on the drug trafficking routes from Af Afghanistan, as well as organizations, OSCE is a member of the Paris Pact, as is the European Commission. Um, so these are areas that are working uh, on a regional basis. Uh, part of the, the Central Asia strategy has been to develop the Central Asian region, Regional Information Co Coordination Center, which is based in Almaty. Uh, as I understand it, that's also uh, home to the SICA. Um, so there could be definitely the possibility of some uh, synergies there. Uh, that the CARIC uh, has now, uh, has all the members of the MOU states, including Russia, which just recently signed uh, formally the ratification uh, of the CARIC agreement, 
uh, the only country that has not signed the agreement, although it is signed at the presidential res level but has not ratified, is Uzbekistan. There is a uh, high hope that now that Russia has signed that Uzbekistan may follow suit. Uh, that organization has been dedicated to analyzing the situation, to sharing intelligence, and to promoting operations in the region. Uh, and they've had a number of successful operations with the observer states, uh, a number of operations in Turkey as well as uh, in the broader region. Uh, Afghanistan is an observer of the Carrick, uh, as well as the Italy, the United States government, um, the United Kingdom and Germany. Uh, China is looking at the possibilities of, of observer status. So again, the fact that it's located in Almaty may offer opportunities for um, synergies with SICA, uh, certainly discussions about possibilities for cooperation. What I would say in, in regard to regional uh, counter-narcotics issues is a coordination issue. Uh, there has been a problem in the region of a lack of coordination among international organizations and among the uh, countries working on a bilateral basis, our own included, uh, and the, there's a great need that if new initiatives are going to be promoted by organizations in the counter-narcotics area, that that really needs to be uh, closely coordinated with the uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and others, uh, and the Paris Pact uh, obviously provides uh, an opportunity to do that. There will be a policy-level meeting of the Paris Pact in Vienna on the 17th of March this month, and I'm sure that OSCE will be participating in that. So that's just a, a brief overview of what's going on in the region related to counter-narcotics and uh, uh, a hope that uh, OSCE and SICA can uh, join into that effort, again, on a very coordinated basis. Thank you. I'd like to thank our last speaker as well as all the other speakers on, on this panel as I uh, close this panel as well as the, uh, the conference. It was very informative. Uh, I'd like to thank all the participants, both uh, those who spoke and as well as those who attended. And uh, closing uh, the conference, let me invite everybody to uh, uh, enjoy the reception, uh, which uh, I had announced at the uh, beginning or earlier that uh, we would now have. And any questions you may have in mind, please take it up with uh, the panelists later. Thank you all.